you're always listening, you're always watching, you're always paying attention for anything that's interesting. If it's interesting to you, it's gonna be interesting to other people. But I love stories about real people doing real things. Everybody has a story and everybody wants to be heard. So if you can be the person who can just sit and listen and give someone the space and the opportunity to tell their story in a really like, you know, trust-filled environment that most people are hungry for that and they wanna, they want that and they will open up to you. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Real Conversations. I'm Dustin Richardson from the Burbank International Film Festival. Today, I'm speaking with Jennifer Steinman Sternen, an accomplished director, producer, editor, and founder of Walnut and Rose Pictures. Her claimed documentaries include Motherland, Desert Runners, Hi, I'm Nancy Rubin, and so many more. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm great. I'm happy to be here. Nice to see you. <laughs> I just want to say every project of yours it's just they're incredibly powerful, incredibly moving, and incredibly human. And the subject material you choose, it's often very uplifting. It celebrates the good sides of humanity, but it also discusses difficult issues that we face as well. But there always seems to be this sense of community involved that I just mm -hmm. love. And I think they're just so well done. So, so great to talk to you about them. Thank you. That's a, that's a, that's a lovely compliment. I'd also just like to say you won a Telly Award. You were nominated for an Emmy. You've gone to Tribeca. You've spoken at festivals, events around the world. So I'm just curious. Let's just begin this talk with what initially sent you on this career path and why were you specifically drawn to documentaries? Oh, that's such a good question. Well, I was studying film as an undergrad uh, in San Diego. And I, well, before I started studying film, I should say I was studying I was a sociology major and I was studying all about people and all about society. And I remember being young, like 18 or 19. And I felt like I was learning about all of the isms in the world, like sexism, racism, everything ism. And I went through this period where I was just coming home from school every day, really depressed and really sad about the state of the world. And it felt like I was taking a lot of information in, but that I didn't have any outlet to make a difference or to express my feelings about it or to, you know, do something with all that information. Um, and so the first thing that came to mind is that I was interested in social documentaries. Um, and so I switched my major to film and I started studying film. And so that was always my original love was documentaries that could, you know, make a difference in the world and could address some of these issues of our times. And then right after school, you know, which I think happens to a lot of, you know, young people. I got offered a job in the commercial world and it was more money than I even knew existed. And the next thing I knew, I got sucked sort of into this path of commercial filmmaking. So I did TV for a long time. I did commercials. I think there was always that feeling in me that I wanted to get back to that someday. And so I, and I, I got into editing. I love editing. Editing was my favorite part of the process. So I was a, I worked as a professional editor for a long time. And then I think it was 2006 when I finally said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm ready now. I want to make my first film. And that was the that was the year I, I filmed my first documentary, Motherland. It premiered at South by Southwest and won some awards. That was fun. That was a fun way to start off your career as yeah. a film director. Um, but it was I mean, it was it was nice that the film got such critical acclaim because it was a it was a tough subject. And um, but it was, you know, we learned a lot. And uh, yeah, it was, it's a film very near and dear to my heart. All the subject material you choose, they're always very unique and very specific. I never know what's going to come from you next, and I love that. So how do you find your subject material, and, and what sort of research is involved before you get to the point where you're like, I'm going to, this is the subject I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to put on film. Oh, that's such, that's such a good question. Um, I mean, it's different for every film. Some things I go out into the world looking for, and other things have found me. So Motherland was uh, one of the women in the film was a good friend of mine and and her her experience kind of guided that story. But I, th I feel like overall, I kind of live my life looking for the story and everything. <laughs> so whether I'm reading a book or I'm picking up a magazine or I'm, you know, scrolling on my phone, I'm like, oh, could that be a good story? Could that be a good story? Could that be a good story? So trying to f and, and trying to find um, good characters too. So like anytime I, I meet someone who I think is, interesting or vibrant in some way, charismatic, like, you know, or has a good story. I'm always paying extra close attention to see if I think there could be something there. So, but I love stories about real people doing real things and having extraordinary experiences with real people. I love stories of people who are just up to amazing things in the world and nobody knows their name, you know? So a lot yeah. of the times it does just kind of come organically then. You, you, it'll, you'll just find the right person and just go for it. 
Yeah. So like Desert Runners, which is a film about, you know, desert ultra marathon runners, these crazy, insane people who run a thousand miles through the desert. I was just at a conference and one and and this guy was up on t- on stage and he was telling a story about this desert ultra marathon that he was going to run. And it was insane. And I was like, who are you? <laughs> and I literally just walked right up to him and I was like, what are you talking about? What is this? I mean, ultra marathons are very um, well known now. But back in 2010, when I met him, you know, most people, most people hadn't heard of anything more than a regular marathon. That was a really exciting film to make. I it was sort of delving to this world that I had no idea what it was about, but I was sort of pulled in by the idea of, you know, people who are, you know, who are doing something that most of us think is impossible. And yet this group of people thinks it's possible. And like, why is that? Why do some people think something's possible that other people think is impossible? And like, what's the difference in mindset? What's that all about? So I was uh, super interested in that. So I literally just bumped into him at a conference and ended up following him for a year and a half with my camera. <laughs> um, but then the next film I made, um, Grandma and Ginga, which is about these two hundred plus year old sisters who became internet superstars. They are actually the grandparents of one of the desert runners. <laughs> and that was how it was a, it was a guy who was a desert ultra marathon runner who he was, he wasn't in my film, but he was a fan of the film. We were Facebook friends and he kept posting about his grandma who was becoming famous. And I saw the story online and I was like, Hey Frank, we got to make a movie about your grandma. <laughs> so <laughs> one led to the other. And then my most recent film, uh, which is called Hi, I'm Nancy Rubin. It's about my high school teacher. I was one of her students in the, in the eighties and she, um, was really extraordinary. That was commissioned by the Magnolia Channel. And they have a series called Hi, I'm Blank. And each episode is about a different phenomenal person who's doing something, you know, heartwarming and and special in the world. And so I pitched my my high school teacher to them and they said, yes, let's do it. That's awesome. I'm so glad you brought that up. That was actually one of my questions was exactly that because I had just seen this one recently and I know you're from the Bay Area. Were you her student? Um, I was her student. Now I know. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) She taught a class to high school sophomores. It was a required course and it was called social living. I mean, it was kind of a fancy name for sex ed basically, but it was like, it was sex ed, but it was also like life ed. It was, I mean, today they have something called social emotional learning that kids take. That was like not a thing when I was growing up. So, but this was kind of the closest thing to it. And it was just kind of all about life and and her class was organized in a circle and kids would have to talk to each other. It gave you like a lot of life skills. So um, it was really special. There was no other class like it back then. And she had a final assignment um, that she gave every year. And it was that you had to write a letter to yourself in the future and you could write anything you want. And then you put it in an envelope and then you would write on the back of the envelope when you wanted it sent and you could pick any time. So you could have it sent next week, next year, five years, 10 years. Some people put 40 years on the back and she has been mailing letters for the last 40 years. I mean, she the, she retired from teaching over 20 years ago, but she's still mailing letters. She's been mailing letters for over 40 years to adults from their teenage selves. It's just like the most special, uh, meaningful project. And she's really touched so many people. I mean, thousands and thousands of people over the course of her career. Um, so it was really fun to honor her with this film. I think she tried to add it up and it was over 12,000 that she must, must 12 letters that she must have mailed. I want her to have this record of what, of what she accomplished. So, and now it's on HBO and I'm like, I'm so happy for her. <laughs> so I know cool. that's so cool. When did you get your letter then? I got my letter on my 21st birthday, which, you know, when you're 15, you, you think 21 is so old and so far away. I didn't know that other people were putting, put it, send it on my 40th birthday, my 50th birthday. I wish I had thought of that. It would have been incredible to get on my, on my 50th birthday. It was, it was pretty fun to get, but I wasn't quite far enough away from high school. I don't think. Like you had said, some of these people were friends, teachers. How do you find a way to make them feel just so comfortable sharing themselves in this manner and on film? Because it amazes me, like, they don't only seem comfortable, they seem extremely comfortable, like almost like the camera's not even there. So as a director, how do you how do you kind of achieve that trust? Yeah, that's a really good question. And probably, I would say probably the most important thing in being a documentary filmmaker. Um, I think that building trust with people is sort of paramount. And I've seen how, um, you know, I've been doing this for 
over 15 years now. And 15 years ago, it was a lot easier. I think people were a lot more um, willing to just open up and share with a filmmaker. Now in the culture that we live in where cameras are everywhere and people are being filmed and people are way more suspicious and they know how things can get, you know, used against them. Um, it's really, really important for people to get to know you, to know what you're about, to know what your what your intention and your purpose is with what you're gonna do with this footage of them, you know. Um, and that they really, they really have to like trust you and and trust you with their stories. So I mean, I think it takes a long time to build that trust. It's not something you get on your first shoot. You know, um, when I think about some of the shoots on Desert Runners, I mean, some of the most beautiful moments that we have with people was after we've been we've been together for like seven months. You know, like it takes a long time to where it becomes organic and natural, kind of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm not the filmmaker anymore and they're not a person in the film. We're friends and we're having a conversation. I feel really honored that all of the people who are in my movies to have trusted me that way. I mean, I think there are people out there who are trying to trick people into saying what they want them to say or might not have the best intentions for the people they're filming. And I've even had a couple projects where I didn't connect with the people in my project in that way. And I ended up not doing the project because I just felt like I don't want to, I don't want, that's not the kind of film I want to make. So um, it's that, that bond or that trust is super, super important to me. And it takes, it takes a while to build in. And I would say the number one skill is listening. Everybody has a story and everybody wants to be heard. So if you can be the person who can just sit and listen and give someone the space and the opportunity to tell their story in a really like kind and, and you know, trust filled environment that most people are hungry for that. And they want to, they want that and they will open up to you. Like before even shooting, like, do you spend a lot of time with them talking about like kind of your plans or just getting to know them as people? to start to build that trust even before you roll the camera. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, sometimes I'm afraid I'm going to miss something <laughs> if I'm not <laughs> true. The <laughs> it to I mean, it's different with every project and it's different with every person. And you can kind of if you're an intuitive person and and have a sense for people, you know when they feel comfortable having the camera roll. And I would never roll a camera until that person felt comfortable knowing that the camera was on. So if I, they had any trepidation or if they didn't feel like they knew me well enough yet or vice versa, then yes, I would absolutely spend more time with that person and, and have more conversations. And then sometimes I also do like a first interview that's maybe, maybe it doesn't end up being the best interview, right? But it's the first sort of break the ice interview. And then when you come back the second time, the third time, maybe you get a little deeper. They know you better. They know what to expect. It's not foreign to them. And maybe that's where you end up getting some of your deeper material. It's a relationship building process for sure. And a lot of documentaries are being made at the pace in which they can raise their funding. So that that's a big piece of how long sometimes people end up working on things. Like I, I know I have many filmmaker friends who are 10 years in on a project, you know? I mean, there's many films that take five, 10, 15, even 15 years to make. And the fastest film I have made, I've made is the Nancy Rubin film because it was commissioned by, you know, Magnolia and it's streaming on Max. Like, so the money was all there at once to make it. But many filmmakers are raising chunks, doing a little work, raising another chunk, doing a little work, raising another chunk. So, you know, fundraising is sort of the barrier to access, I guess you could say, <laughs> that holds up a lot of these films. And then also some of these stories, you start off thinking it's going to be this short thing that you're going to do for a little while, and then something happens and it becomes something else. And then yeah. something else is happening and becomes something else. And the next thing you know, you're still filming and it's been five years because things just keep happening and you're following the things. So it really depends on the subject matter and the, and the story, especially for something that's a, you know happening in real time. Then there's also lots, lots of documentary filmmakers who are making films about things that have happened in the past, that can be a much quicker process. But if you're actually trying to follow something in real time, that that just takes as long as it takes for the story to happen. What exactly does a director do on a documentary like this? Like I'll use Desert Runners in, as, as an example. It's a road trip movie. When you kind of know that in your mind that and, and anything that's like a race, for example, you know, it's going to have a beginning, a middle and an end. So that kind of structure is a very like safe structure to follow because you're like, I'm I know it's going to have a beginning. Then I know something's going to happen in the middle. I don't know what that thing is yet, but something's got to happen um, when, you know, people who've 
who are not professional runners try to run across a desert in the world's most inhospitable terrain. So something's going to happen and then there will be a resolution. So that's kind of like, I knew going into making that film, like I have no idea what's going to happen out there, but something will. And my job is to have my eyes in every direction and be like ready and follow anything that I think could turn into something else. So, um, and that entire film was shot by me and, and, a cameraman, like just the two of us out there. We did all seven continents in one year. And the shoots were probably seven to 10 days each at the, at the time, but that it was just the two of us. And we had to kind of be all the eyes and ears and, and just paying attention all the time. And I mean, I still think back on certain things that happened that I cannot believe we happened to be there when it happened. Like, you know, there are things that happened in that movie that I'm like, what if we hadn't just happened to drive up right at that moment? You know, I mean, because they're like key moments in, in, in the year. But I think that's really like the magic of it. You're always listening. You're always watching. You're always paying attention for anything that's interesting. If it's interesting to you, it's going to be interesting to other people. So that's kind of what I always tell myself, I'm like, do I think this is interesting? <laughs> um, I think this might be interesting. Let's just, and, and sometimes you chase something and you chase it for a long time and then it ends up not being anything. And then you're like, okay, let's go find something else. Just having your spidey sense kind of on all the time. It was definitely like a, a career moment, like to, to have that opportunity to, to travel like that and to be with those people and to, you know, and it was really interesting. I mean, I think something that that people don't really think about that much, or at least I hadn't as a young filmmaker, was that, you know, I knew I was filming them and filming their experience and that it was cool for me to watch their experience. But I didn't, at that early time in my career, I didn't really fully understand how our presence there affected their experience and changed their experience. Some people want to believe like that are that we can be invisible and that we're just flies on the wall, but it's not true. And it's not true for the people that you're filming. Like we are there and we are a part of their experience. So it really was something we were all having together. And I remember one of um, the runners saying to me at the end of the year, he said, I can't imagine what this year would have been like without the two of you filming. And he said, because every step of the way, you kept asking me questions about how I was feeling. And he's like, I didn't know. <laughs> and he was like, and if you hadn't been there asking me, I probably never would have stopped to think about it. Like I probably just would have run and I wouldn't have been constantly explaining like, okay, right now I'm feeling this way. Okay, right now I'm feeling this way right, right now. So I, because we were there prompting with those questions and he was forced to answer it, he ended up having a completely different experience of this run than he would have if, he had just done it and there had been no film crew there. So I think that was a really sort of beautiful lesson for me about like the two-way street of it all. And that it's such an honor for me to be there and allowed into their world, but also they get something from it too. So it's a, it's a, it's an exchange, you know? I wonder when I watched documentaries, I was thinking this while watching Nancy, where it's like when you're following her to the mailbox, was that something like you specifically wanted? Like, I want to try to get this shot. I don't make stuff up like I, like very often. I mean, I, I won't say never, sometimes I do, but, <laughs> but for the most part, I'll have an idea. Like if you have any letters to mail coming up, could we film that? And she would say, oh yeah, I have a letter that I'm mailing next week. And I'd be like, great, can we come? I try to make it as authentic as possible, you know, but it's usually me asking them, like, what do you have coming up? In Desert Runners, one of our runners got sick and, and had to go home. And so then I called him the next week and I said, when are you going to the doctor? You know, he gave me the date and I said, can I come on that date and film you? So we have a scene of him going to the doctor. I, I ask a lot of questions and that informs a lot of it. Um, and then sometimes they'll tell me, yeah, like, hey, I'm doing this. Is that interesting to you? And then I would I would say yes or no and and either come to film it or not film it. So I, I do think it's a lot of give and take. What is your uh, your editing process? You know, after all this footage you collect for however amount of time, there must be so much footage that never makes it into the final cut. And I bet sometimes that's really hard. How do you do that? How do you organize <laughs> all that and and find the right moments through all that? It takes a really long time. I mean, editing a feature documentary can take anywhere from six months to a year and a half. People take a long time figuring that out. And there's always going to be stuff that you just love that, but it just doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit in the movie. I mean, I, I, my most vivid memory of that was this one scene in Motherland that we had filmed in like the most beautiful place in South Africa. It was 
stunningly beautiful. It was like one of the best days we had on this trip to South Africa. But like the scene just didn't fit in the movie and I couldn't find a place for it. And I'll never forget. I was like sitting there at my computer and I hit I hit delete and then I hit undo <laughs> and then I hit delete and then I hit undo. <laughs> and I just sat there and I was like, am I really doing this? Like, am I really cutting it? And then I did end up cutting it and it just didn't have a place in the movie. So that that happens a lot. I'm in a um, unique position because I was an editor first and that's, um, and I started off editing other people's films before I started directing my own. And so with my own films, I prefer not to edit them. I think it's really hard to edit and direct at the same time. So I'll, I'll hire an editor. I'll have them do sort of for a first pass. Then I might want to like take it and work on it for a little while myself and tweak a couple of things. And then after a while, I'll, I'll lose perspective and I'll be like, okay, you take it back now. And then they'll work for a little while. And then, and then for so far with my films, I've ended up being the person who finished them. Like, like I, there's always like little tiny things I want to do at the end that it's almost easier for me to just do them than it is to explain it to someone else. So mm -hmm. um, I tend to work like, like a tag team with another editor when I'm directing. I directed my first fiction film last year. It was hilarious. Like, first of all, the edit was so easy. I couldn't believe it because I had a script yeah. <laughs> and I was like, Guys, this is so easy, so much easier. Why have I been doing for my whole career? I could have just had a script. And then I was like working with the actors and they were incredible. And they would like, they just did whatever I told them to do. I was like, so much easier than real people. <laughs> I'm like, these actors, you just hire them and they do what you want. And then you edit it and you already have a script. I was like, this is so fantastic and so easy. What have I been doing? <laughs> um, yeah, so... I think the work in narrative comes in the writing of the script, which is interesting. It's the same hard work for documentary, but in in fiction, you write the script before you shoot. And in documentary, you write the script after you shoot. And that's really the big difference. I've always wanted to do it. And I'm a little mad at myself that I didn't do it 20 years ago because I sort of feel like I messed up and maybe did the wrong career. But anyway. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, it's like the one of the funnest things I've ever done in my whole career. And I definitely want to do more of it. But it's a, it's a short film. It's a oh. magical realist story about a young mother who runs away from her life and ends up meeting a curious stranger at a motel pool. You know, it's a meditation on motherhood and partnership and the complications of it and the choices that women make, like literally one of the funnest shoots of my life. You know, And the lead actor is one of my very best friends that I grew up with, who's a, a professional working actor in New York. And she had just the most stellar performance. The collaboration that happens on a fiction film set is so beautiful. And you don't really get that in documentary. Like in documentary, you're just like, like I said, like we were like a two person band out there. Like I'm kind of doing everything myself. And then even when I do have a crew, it's still like, you know, the director is also the production designer and the, <laughs> uh, you know, and the talent scout and the, you know, I, I kind of ended up doing it all. And in this, I had, I had department heads. I had people who were in charge of each piece and who are really like talented in their particular craft. And it's so fun collaborating with those people. Like, it's so fun just having this team that's like all there for your movie and all there to work together. And um, I just, I really, really love that collaboration. So I think it's really special. And yeah, I hope I get to do more of it. And I also like to mention just really quick, you started a group called the Bay Area Women Directors Collective. Could you tell us a little bit about that? There's an international organization called the Film Fatales. Um, and there it's an organization of women feature film directors that started in New York about, gosh, 11, 12 years ago already. And I was living in New York at the time and I um, had just joined it, but then some things happened in my life and I had to move back to California. So I never got to go to the group when it was in New York. So I got to California and I wrote to the woman who started the organization and I said, could I start the San Francisco chapter? And she said, sure. We started off as a film fatales chapter. We were eight women at the first meeting in the um, in my living room <laughs> in 2015. And eight years later, um, there's I think we have about 85 women on our on our roster, all feature film directors in the in the greater Bay Area. And over the past eight years, you know, we've grown to become like a really incredible community supporting each other to get our films made. So I think that I think filmmaking, especially indie filmmaking, can be really isolating. So it's just been really special to have this group of women who were all sort of behind each other, rooting each other on. We also hire each other, watch each other's rough cuts. And we've changed our name a couple years back. 
mostly for insurance reasons. At heart, we are still the Femme Fatales, Femme Fatales which you, you've probably heard of. There's a giant LA chapter. Is there any new projects you're working on that you'd like to share with us? I'm doing some editing for other filmmakers this year. I'm working um, for the third time on a series called Your Santa, which is a really sweet, heartwarming holiday show that's on um, Hulu. I kind of like to alternate between doing my own films and helping other people with their films. So, Is there any advice you would give to any aspiring documentary filmmakers who might be watching this episode? You know, I'm not going to lie. This is a really tough moment for the film industry. I always tell people to follow the joy. That's the advice I'm giving myself these days too. So if something is feeling too hard or like there's too many barriers coming up, it's probably the universe letting you know to take try a different path. If I follow the things that feel joyful, the path always opens up. Get a skill, like have a real concrete skill. Most of the working documentary filmmakers I know also either edit, they shoot, they write, they do something else so that they can get paid to work on other people's films while they are also making their own. And I think that's how most of us have made a sustainable career out of this. There are not enough sound people right now, and especially women, sound women. If you're out there, girls, become a sound woman. We need you. <laughs> it's a great way to make a lot of money. And then you can also direct your own films. <laughs> that's great advice, Jennifer. Thank you so much for talking with me today and sharing your stories and your process. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Dustin. So good to talk to you. Thank you for watching the Burbank International Film Festival's Real Conversations. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. We are the media capital of the world and our festival has a lot to offer. So stick around to see more episodes and other festival content.